strong. Hi, welcome to Funny Minds. I'm Lynn B. And I am your co-guru today, Mr. Edward Biss. Today, I am super excited, man. This is this is huge for me, especially. Today, we are psyched, totally psyched, to have with us today the uh, founding members, guitar guru, extraordinaire, producer, now uh, has his own guitar uh, line out, which we're going to get to, which we're super, I'm super excited about, Mr. Steve Brown from the famous well, both renowned rock band Trickster. How are you, brother? Excellent, excellent. Thanks for having me on. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Eddie. And hi, everybody out there in the worldwide intraweb. Yes, really. I mean, like, everybody looks forward to see what kind of rock star we're going to have on next, you know? They're going to be very excited when uh, when I announce you. Well, so, honored to be here. Yes, we're very honored, too. I was looking at your bio, boy. Let me tell you, like, I mean, you've been on the stage with some really hefty people. Some of the people that I absolutely love and adore, especially like Cheap Trick and Journey. And I like, oh, my God. <laughs> I really envy you. I really envy you. I got um, to sit and watch them. But, you know, <laughs> you got to play with them. It's been it's been a blessed life. You know, I, I say it all the time and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I have lived for the better part of 40 years that I've been in this business a complete rock and roll fantasy life. You know, I've worked my tail off to get where I am and for the success and for these great experiences, but it never gets lost on me because as you can tell by looking around my studio and my house, I am also, not only am I just a mu professional musician, I'm also a super fan. I still love all these bands, you know, whether it's Kiss, Van Halen, Cheap Trick, journey you know they're they're my friends yes but they're all i'm still a fan of rock i still get that same feeling that i did when i was a 10 year old kid listening to you know van halen or kiss it's still that shot of rock and roll that has, oh yeah that feeling i get and i hope you guys and everybody out there feels the same way because there's nothing like it i absolutely man you, you really... stay forever forever what got yeah. you know what brought you into it <clears throat> is still as you know as bright today as it was then which shows me that that, that is your true passion without a doubt you know, when that without that's, a doubt. you know I, I i i have a hard time ever saying that i work so hard to do mm -hmm. this and achieve all this because it's what i love it's in my blood it's in my heart it's always been since i started playing guitar in 1978 it's pretty much all i've ever wanted to do so um, you know, and that's kind of the advice I give to all any young people that come to talk to me, you know, kids in bands that I'm working with or what, you know, what's the advice I go, the, the advice is just love what you do and don't expect to be a rock star. But if you love making music and playing music, it will, you will find a way to make it work. And that's the greatest advice that I give to anybody. Do it because you love it. Not because you want to be rich, not because you want to be famous. If that happens, yeah. Wow. You're the one percent like I am that ever got that opportunity and ever had any real success in this business. But if you do it for the right reasons, you'll never lose and you'll never be disappointed. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And it, it's interesting to see how things have come from where we were way back in the day because we're all the farts. And, uh, you know, Wait, sitting no, down, one, you know, across from each other, you know, one on one with our guitar teacher and. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> being so excited, you know, and finally playing your first Van Halen riff or your first Priest riff, <clears throat> you know, for sure. And uh, and now you see these kids uh, sit in front of their computer and have basically any guitar player at their fingertips one on one. <laughs> okay, and now yeah. you sit back and you watch these kids play, and they're like AI, you yeah. know, they're just, yeah. They're it's funny you, know. you said that because it's yeah. very much to me, uh, there's a lack of emotion because guitar playing has become almost like a video game. You know, a lot of these, and I try to stress that with new guitar players, like don't sit there and try to learn every Van Halen song or Randy Rhodes note for note. Put your own spin on it, but play with feeling, not just sitting there because it's very easy to sit there, especially on YouTube and 
And look, man, I, I do, you know, in my 80s band Rubik's Cube, I'm constantly learning new songs that I've never learned. So I use YouTube just like everybody else. It's a fabulous tool to be able yeah. to speed things up, mm -hmm. slow things down. But at the same time, for new musicians, you have to still retain that emotion and heart and be able to play and put your own spin on it. You know, when I when we were kids, Eddie, you know, the, you know, my my first learning experience was the Starlicks guitar series, which was a Starlicks, series, yes, and it had a little ten page pamphlet, the Randy Rhodes Starlicks. That was my first thing, and that's how yeah. I learned. And for me, you know, when I was a kid, you know, it was funny. I could never really learn things note for note. I think because my my attention span was so scattered. Like besides wanting to learn the solos, I also wanted to write songs and I wanted to, you know, manage my band and do this. I wanted to do 50 things in one minute. So I just basically would go, yeah, it's close enough. And though it was probably not the best idea, it, I learned very early on. And I also learned from Ed Van Halen because he always said, you know, I, I would always take a, so he would always say like he would learn songs, but he would make them his own, you know, mm -hmm. like the guitar solo and you really got me. That's very, yes. much, very different than what Jimmy Page played. Mm -hmm. So for all you kids who don't know that Jimmy Page is the guitar player on the Who's um, on uh, You Really Got Me, the Kinks rather, the Kinks, yep. um, the original. But to Eddie, you know, that was a great learning thing where I was kind of like, Oh, cool. I don't have to worry about learning note for note. And he said he doesn't play stuff note for note. So, you know, I would always take cover tunes and just kind of do it my way, you know, and it's something that I've done even with playing with Def Leppard or playing with Dennis DeYoung from Styx. You know, I would get close mm -hmm. to what the original, my own spin on it. Okay. I was always That's curious about that, uh, Steve, uh, especially when you, you know, Trickster is one thing because that that was your baby. Uh, you yeah. you were from conception part of it, um, but when you step into a role where you're filling uh, Phil's shoes for Death Leopard, um, the expectations at that point is it a note for note expectation? Obviously, they already have a developed and produced show that they could mix and match songs each night. But you know, I know how everything operates. Um, how much freedom did they give you with that? Well, it was the honestly, man, the only, the only, they knew when I came in and, you know, I filled in for Vivian as well. You know, I started this June uh, in 2013 with them. We're going on 10, uh, over 11 years now, but long story short, you know, they were very cool. They, I knew what to do. And there are certain, like anything, if you play Don't Stop Believing by Journey, you have to pretty much play that solo note for note. Those, those yeah. are they're definitive parts. When you play this <laughs> photograph, it's very much the same thing. It's very, it's iconic. And what Phil's solo on that is one of the greatest, what I call greatest pop metal guitar solos ever, like Jump by, Van, you know, by Ed Van Halen, <laughs> um, Don't Stop Believing. Those are things, uh, Living on a Prayer, Sambora. Those are kind oh, yeah. of, there are, there's not much wiggle room, but there is a little bit and you have to find. So with photograph was interesting because the end of it, the real fast flurry and notes that Phil <clears> done, <throat> that was a spot where I put my own spin on what Phil did because I don't play sort of the way he plays when he does a fast flurry of notes. So I put my own more legato thing as, as a putter, what Phil was doing. Okay. So now, at the end of the day, look, it's all as long as you, you know, pay homage and play the right notes in the in most 95% of the parts. There's always a little bit of wiggle room to add your own spin on it. And, uh, you know, with Def Leppard, Joe Elliott told me the first night that I did shows with them, he said the first night, he said, I don't really care what you do on your guitar as long as you get all those vocal parts. <laughs> and that's cool <laughs> right there, you know he's pretty much him and sav or the bosses of def leopard so i was kind of like all right well if joe says don't worry about the guitar playing so much the vocals but again you know def leopard is one of those bands there are no backing tapes there's no lip syncing 100 percent real and they take those vocals you know the def leopard mutt lang vocal thing <laughs> serious and that was the reason more than anything more than you know my 
my uh, my fancy on stage moves and my guitar playing. It was the vocal uh, yes. my ability that got me that gig uh, first and foremost with Def Leppard. Absolutely, so am- people don't realize how important that is. Uh, w- you know, go- going through this journey um, early on for me, I didn't realize I-, I I could even sing. You know, that's something I discovered later, and then I dumped a, a ton of time and energy into it owned it and like you said it helped me get jobs that's right because it put me in front of uh, many other people getting back to um you know i'm working with this young artist right now this bad the kobe reese band and then kobe's a rock and roll he's a jersey kid he's you know 12 13 years old super talented singer drummer but his guitar player dallas russo is here and this kid's a great guitar player but he doesn't sing and i told him i said kid i said dude dallas you got to learn how to sing. And Steve Lukather talks about this. You know, he's a buddy of mine and he's said it in numerous interviews. And it's one of the greatest piece of advices. And for any musician, if you play your instrument great and you can sing, you will get the gig 98% of the time over somebody else who doesn't sing. Just because you sing. You might not even be a better player, but because you can sing, you sometimes might get that gig because... It's such an important thing. So I tell every musician, Man, absolutely. keyboards, bass, guitar, please learn how to sing. Start now and it's never too late. So you're absolutely. a Jersey boy, right? I am Jersey boy. Yep. Born and raised and still living. <laughs> in- <laughs> Are we from uh, Steve Paramus? I'm from Paramus originally. I uh, resided now in the beautiful mountainous town of Ringwood, New Jersey for the last year. I, I was your neighbor. I, I was in Wanakew. I saw, I was there 36 years. I sold my house a couple of years ago and came up to Mount Arlington, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. You know, and, and Ringwood's a beautiful town too. Very it's beautiful town. The yeah. Great area and we love it. You know, again, I tell people it's the mountains in New Jersey and everybody that comes up here, they just go, wow, this really is the mountains, you know? It is. It's just beautiful. And, and It is. I have a cousin of mine who's right uh, right on the top of Skyline. Right. Top of Sky, very top of Skyline. She's up there, brand new home, like, you know, yeah. $2 million home. Perfect view. <laughs> beautiful. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. The only thing that yeah. sucks is the cold weather. That's it. And, and the taxes. <laughs> And it's I've been taxes, right. right? Jersey is not an easy state to live in. It's not an easy state. No, hell no. Oh, very tough. Yeah. But that was that was the birthplace of Trickster. Steve, when we chatted on the phone and we went back, you know, back in the day a little bit, touched on the China Club and, and back in the early days. And um which was and I don't think this is it's just something I thought about before we had a chance to speak. And I don't think it's something that maybe maybe you have or you haven't even realized or thought about, but back then, um, watching you and, and Trickster start, literally, you know, your original lineup, just getting out there, getting going, um, and we're all in that same boat. We all have that same dream. You know, we're, we're in it. And um, when you go through that experience, everything seems like a pipe dream. You know, like, I'm going to do this, but man, if I could get a record deal and do that, man, that's like a dream come true. So to see you start and then to see you guys progress and then to see you guys make certain moves, step it up a notch and then take that leap. um, That was cool for someone like me and the rest of the um, musicians around you to watch happen. Yeah. Because then we believed we knew it now. Now we know it's true. Yeah. And it could be done because we just seen it happen. Exactly. You know, you know and Eddie, I'm glad you brought that up because that was, you know, look, man, I started the band in uh, 1983 um, when we were, you know, I was 12 years old and it was just such, again, well, it was in my heart and it was all I ever wanted to do. And, you know, back in the 80s, early 80s, it was a magical time. You know, there was so much hope That's and true. so dreams we didn't have the internet we didn't have cell phones all these distractions for me it was playing sports and rock and roll and playing guitar you know so then as time went on you know 1984 you know it, july 10th of this year uh, is going to be 40 years since the first trickster show so that puts things in perspective right there it was your first show 
It was at the Paramus Band Shell behind the Paramus Public Library. And okay. it was on, on series. Yeah. And um, so, you know, to think about that really puts things like, oh, wow. First, I go, wow, I'm getting really old. <laughs> I first go, I to tell you about it. Looking back on it, you know, look, it was all I ever wanted to do. So starting a band and, you know, learning about marketing and, and all these things were directly related to my inf my KISS influence. You know, it was the genius mm -hmm. marketing, the great KISS marketing, you know, and of course, working with Ace over the last couple of years, you know, and hearing about these stories and you learn that it starts with a concept, you know, and it's funny because a concept of Trickster came indirectly from Def Leppard, who, you know, they've mm -hmm. been friends of mine since I was 16 years old, like they're like family to me. But back then there was an interview in Circus Magazine with Rick Allen, and it was an article talking about when Rick Allen joined um, Def Leppard, he was 15 or 16 years old. That was my light bulb moment to where I said, that's going to be my band. We're going to be the youngest, you know, um, youngest hard rock band. We're going to be, we're going to be faster. We're going to jump around more. We're going to wear brighter clothes. And that was the blueprint for Trickster. And lo and behold, that's what happened, you know, because later on after we got signed, you know, the marketing was these guys, Trickster, they're the new kids on the block of rock, you know. But <laughs> yeah. as funny as that, Rockers. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's true. And we all know in whatever business you're in, you have to have a gimmick. What is your what is your marketing plan? And that was so much it. And still to this day, you know, it's it's nice to say, you know, that we still are PJ and I are still out there waving the trickster flag. We still yeah. are youngest, you know, hard rock band from the 80s. That's, that's still right. around and still doing it. I'll tell you what, man, you have I, I was looking at your dates and you got you have a full calendar, which is a good thing now. Oh, and, you know, man. juggling everything you've done, everything you're doing now, now you obviously married, you have a family. You're still out there. You were just out in AZ with uh, the boys tearing it up. You got uh, now new upcoming uh, trickster dates, which uh, I'd like to talk about. And then let's uh, let's open that big old box with the bow on it and talk about your new guitar line, man. Oh, yeah. I love those guitars. <laughs> yeah. I really like them. Well, one thing I wanted to get back to. So what you were saying, Eddie, you know, was very much true back in the trickster days when we started the band and you guys watched us go up the ladder yeah. and how things were progressing for us, for trickster, it was John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora, the Bon Jovi guys. You know, I was a fan. We were with the band and Pete and I, we were huge Bon Jovi fans from day one and knowing yeah. that they were Jersey guys. And that goes into our Jersey heart and soul and our mentality to where it's very much like a, all the bands on our scene back in the eighties, it was a community and we all kind of looked out for each other. So <laughs> Bon Jovi guys, John Bon Jovi was the first guy who got behind Trickster back in 1986 before Slippery When Wet took off. We gave him a demo tape and he called us and said, man, I think you guys are great. A couple months later, he introduced us to the Skid Row guys, Snake and Rachel and Scotty. Oh, wow. Like our big brothers and helped us out. So very much... Uh, that Jersey brotherhood thing that we learned from Bon Jovi and Skid Row, I guess what you were talking about translated to you because I get that all the time. You know, everybody going, man, yeah. watched you guys from the beginning, especially guys who saw us play the Paramus band shell in 1984 and saw the progress of the band. So it's very much, you know, very much rooted in that Jersey um, mentality, that brotherhood and, and everybody kind of, looking out for each other and being happy for each other where I saw yeah. the sunset strip scene was very different than that. Those guys. Oh, that, that was definitely a little bit more bloodthirsty. Yeah, there was, there was, <laughs> it was brutal. And that it, was a little bit more bloodthirsty, but Jersey yeah, was, yeah. we had it definitely a good scene and uh, it really made it real to us. And, and it showed us that this is definitely this, you made it happen. We can make it happen. And for me, it happened later on, but who cares? You still plug at it and you just know it's possible, you know? So that was, that was huge. And what, what little, uh, what people need to realize too, is that not only did you break into the scene as Trickster, but Trickster did release a couple more albums. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, we we uh, you, so know, you weren't one and done. You had a total of what three? Well, uh, no, five or six, including oh, no. live yeah. album and and uh, undercovers, which was the first record oh, okay. recorded in this studio when I built this studio. You know, that was always a dream of mine, and that was you know a, a huge influence from Ed Van Halen. You know, I remember the first week I bought this house. I went up to see Van Halen and I told Ed, I told him and Alex, I said, Hey man, I just bought a house and I'm building a studio and it's called, I'm calling my studio 6160. And Ed goes, he, he goes, he, you know, he always had a cigarette and he goes, why are you calling it 60? What the hell is 6160? I go, I don't know. You got 5150, but I got 6160. I don't know what it means, but it sounds really cool. And we, (laughs) but it was always me for me because I always wanted to be able to engineer, produce, make my own music. And so instead of going out and buying like a car, a Ferrari or a Corvette, I built this studio and invested Mm -hmm. my money into my future as a songwriter, producer and engineer. And it's the greatest investment I ever made. Very smart. Very smart investment. Yes. (laughs) We have a, uh, are you using Pro Tools? Yes, I am. I am a Pro Tools guy on a, uh, custom built PC that I'm um, uh, that I've had me by a good friend of mine another Jersey guy Scott Khan a different PC and uh, it's great you know again as much as I love touring and playing live I am a studio uh, rat I love being here in my studio thank God it's very cozy and very uh, inspirational if you it looks will. that way that's <laughs> a last man cave <laughs> yeah you know it's a, so it's let's a, hear about your guitar line. I'm I'm just I'm dying. I'm looking at these guitars yeah. in the background. They're just there absolutely go. those, gorgeous. Yes, those are a couple of the new models that just came out. The red one over here is the showroom series, and this one right here is the custom series. Which these guitars, it was always a dream of mine to have my own company. Never thought it would really happen, but uh, my my dear friend Jay Abin, who owns the company GuitarFetish.com. He came to me about five years ago and he said, listen, I want to do a signature line with you. He did a, a signature line with the great Earl Slick, who was John Lennon and David. Yes. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. He did these really incredible, like relic, old looking guitars, but with new features. And they were at this incredible price point, you know, which no one was doing at the time. And these really cool, you know, again, relic things and these vintage finishes and um, he came to me and he said, I want to do a Van Halen style guitar with the locking tremolos like I pl- I've been playing for 40 years. And I was like, great. And uh, so we started working on this line, you know, pre-COVID. And, um, and lo and behold, you know, last summer, um, July of 2023, we launched SBS Guitars. It's an online only guitar and they're just incredible hard rock shred guitar style machines at an unbelievable price. So this one retail, it sells online for $259. And when I tell you it is as good as any guitar I've ever played over the last 40 years, um, you know, Canadian hard rock, maple, alder bodies, my signature SBS guitar pickups here, Alnico T, custom wound. And they're not only great playing guitars because I use, just so everybody knows, I use these stock guitars out on the road. I do no mm-hmm. modifications. These are exactly how they come. The only thing I put it in is a trim blocker because I don't like the trim to go back for all the guitar nerds out of there, out there. Mm-hmm. Right out of the box, these guitars are yeah. phenomenal. And uh, again, it's been a dream come true. And the goal was to give everybody that opportunity to be able to have a great 80s style rock guitar. And we have these custom finished ones, and then we have relic versions, which are the vintage series that came out. So there's pretty much something for everybody. And again, I can't rave about how fantastic it, the guitars are. You know, you gotta you gotta put a little elbow grease in them, maybe. You know, at this price point, they're not gonna come off the shelves like, you know, um, like a fifteen hundred dollar guitar. Most of the time they are, but sometimes you gotta you gotta bring them to your guy to have set up. Put an extra hundred dollars into it, and you basically have a fifteen hundred dollar guitar. So, it's uh, response has just been incredible all around the world. 
Yeah, I mean, just just the visual alone. I mean, I know for a fact. I mean, you could just see the wood, uh, the wood on the neck, the fretboard, the headstock. Um, you know, I mean, love. I love. It's really nice. I mean, the neck is just beautiful. It is good. It just screams super speed, man. I mean, I like the the, the size of the body. Yeah. Um, you and I have the same taste, obviously. So, and see, when you came out with the uh, when you came out with the relic, with that was the first one that caught my eye, and that's the one. And I, I told her, I was like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be using that one." Yeah. So yeah. I gotta, I gotta hop online and, and order order me one of those bad boys. Uh, use Wait a minute. Do you do do you do affiliate programs, Steve? Oh, uh, I don't really know right now. You know, that's not my department. I, I don't mm-hmm. handle. My partner, Jay, at guitarfetish.com, he handles stuff like that. I, re- I don't really know. Right now, we're just, we're, you know, it's mail order direct. And, you know, at this yeah, price yeah. point, you can't win. The CS series, those are, that's a $259 guitar. And when mm-hmm. I it, it's mind-blowing. Um, I, I just never in a million years would have thought. But, you know, it goes back to the thought process. You know, look, back in the day, you know, Ed Van Halen's Frankenstein guitar, that was a parts guitar. It was basically... Yeah. Hundred and eighty dollars to build, you know. So again, it's it's the a lot of it has to do with the guitar player itself. But nowadays, the way they're building these guitars overseas and how they're able to mass manufacture and with the CNC, yeah. you're pretty much getting the same quality all around. And and you know, again, I, I attribute this so much to my partner and uh, the guitar fetish team for uh, for doing this. But it's just. Like yeah, I was I was pretty impressed when I not not just from a visual and obviously the quality of and anybody who knows anything about guitars could just take one look and just in your head calculate what a lock and tremolo costs, what pickups yeah. cost, what wood that type of wood costs, right? The tuners, all the hardware, the electronics. What you know, if you calculate it in your head and then you look at the price point that you're putting it out on, ah, is is mind blowing. Yeah, and, and um, you know that that's really what caught my eye, and and I and I really I I got on the phone with Neil, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> oh, that's a lot of- I sent him an immediate text. I was like, "Did you see this guitar? Did you see this price?" And saying, "No, Joe, oh, away." And you know, it's to be able to be able to, you know, we're, we're also you have to look at you know again for the business people out there, it's marketing, and you got to know where. So there was no guitar like this in that price point. Where it's something of this high quality at a three hundred and fifty nine dollar price range, you know, uh, there's nothing that compares to it. And uh, you know, again, it's just my way of wanting to be able to give back, to be able to get right. so everybody can afford and get a quality guitar. I mean, two hundred fifty nine dollars for a guitar like that that comes in multiple colors, you know, it's phenomenal. And again, I've been using this live. I took it out on the road. The thing stays in tune great. It looks great. Oh, my God. That's great. Home run. I don't think I've ever seen it. People don't even realize you couldn't buy a guitar for that much back in, like, I was just going to say that. When you you started, Eddie, I don't think I spent anything under $500 for all the guitars I bought you. Yeah. No, one of them was under $500. I mean, it was amazing. And, and of course, they had to have custom-made things and whatever. But right. You, you know, get back in the day, you couldn't yeah. get a guitar, any guitar that was under three hundred dollars, completely unplayable. Right? No, you're way. right. The technology, like I said, those CNC machines and how they're able to mass manufacture, and that's the way we do it. But you know, again, it's just been um, such a labor of love, and the response to it has just been incredible. And there's a lot more to come with SBS and guitar fetish. Now, what does SBS stand? Steve Brown sound. Nice. Brown. Nice. Okay. Hey, do you still have the uh, you still have the red Charvel? I do I do not. Um I oh. have to a friend of mine, but this guitar right here, this is pretty much the the homage to it because this is a Ferrari red. And I told Jay when we came out with these guitars, I had to have a Ferrari red because that was my First real good guitar that I bought from Sam Ash in Paramus, New Jersey. It was uh, on one of the original Charvels that took nine months to get. And I worked at the Exxon gas station on Paramus. Yeah. And, you didn't uh, work at Sam Ash? <laughs> I never worked at Sam Ash. No, I should have all the time I spent there. <laughs> I can't really. 
Exactly. We would just, just Steve, we would have worked for free, man. We would have just owed the money. Well, yeah, I, I definitely think I sold that, sold a bunch of guitars for him because I used to go there. I used to ride my bike every day after school, and I would just go there and play the different Kramers, the Charvels, the BC Rich, what oh, yeah. cool, the Gibson, whatever <laughs> guitar they had. I would sit there for hours and just playing and, and, you know, testing stuff out. They'd be like, Steve, here, play this one, play that one. So, you know, it's all good. got old uh, Garden What's State Plaza. Roster? What's up? <laughs> your roster now, Steve? What, what are you up to? What are you going to be up to? What do you well, do for the next couple of months? Yeah, the next couple of weeks, I have a couple Rubik's Cube shows, and Rubik's Cube is my 80s band that I play in. Uh, PJ, also from Trickster, plays in that with me. It's this incredible 80s show that we do, um, you know, the greatest 80s tribute in the world, as we like to call it. Okay. And a bunch of those gigs. And then um, middle of May, we start the Trickster, uh, Trickster Tour, where we're going to be going out with Enough's Enough, Pretty Boy Floyd, and Band Inc. So what's really cool about this is it's the first trickster tour that we've done where it's been more than a week, let's say, in since 1995. Wow. So we're pretty much going from the East Coast here, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, all the way out to uh, Houston, Texas and back. So it's going to take us in a loop. And uh, mm -hmm. we're so excited because we've been friends with, you know, Chips Enough and the guys for yeah 30 years they're like brothers, you know, they're our brothers. So we're going, yeah. and up. And Pretty Boy Floyd, they're dear friends as well. And they were also label mates of ours back on MCA Records back in the 80s and 90s. So it's uh, kind of an MCA reunion. And there's this great band out of uh, Massachusetts, Band Inc. That's going to be the first band on. Uh, Juliana is the bass player. She's a phenomenal uh, female singer and bass player. She's got a great hard rock band. So it's gonna be a real, uh, it's gonna be a real treat, and uh, like is I it said, gonna be a, a full blown trickster set, or is it gonna be an acoustic set, or a little bit of both? We're actually doing it's gonna be trickster electric, as I like to call it. It's nice. a pre show. It's me and PJ and our and our friend Ben Ben Hands, who's been playing with us <laughs> doing the trickster acoustic stuff. We started doing the electric show um, in January. We went out on the Chris Jericho re rock and wrestling cruise. And Chris was like, I don't want the trickster acoustic. I want you guys to play electric. So we're like, cool, let's do it. And we didn't. Yeah, let me argue with Chris Jericho. <laughs> right. Uh, this is our good bud. You know, PJ plays in Fozzie with him. Yep. So, you know, I know Chris. I yeah. know Chris. He's a good guy. He's a local. Yeah, he's in Tampa down oh, by. So we, uh, we were just like, let's go for it. And as soon as we did that, I said to PJ, I'm like, we got to do a lot more of this. And then in February, we did a show opening for Mr. Big up in uh, Rome, New York. And we did the same thing, and it oh, was really, really feels good. The only thing for me is I got to get used to doing the pedal board dance, if you will, which is stepping on the pedals. And to see, yeah. you know, it was like <laughs> when getting, well, I was like tripping up, you know, and I was like, man, I have to rehearse doing all these pedal changes because I, I use on my head rush pedal board. I have a lot of different sounds for these songs. I was like, wow, just on Surrender alone, the power ballad, I have like six different changes that I have to do. And I was like, wow, I actually got to practice this. <laughs> yeah. You're like you gluing to the board. To <laughs> yeah. So I just got to get used to it so I can move a little bit and, you know, do some scissor kicks and jump around a bit. Hell yeah. DP bands. Really? Are you doing, uh, Steve, are you handling a vocal for that, for the Trickster show too? Or you have someone yeah, stepping yeah. in or is meeting with you? PJ, PJ and Ben, but you know, PJ sings a couple of the songs. I think he's going to be singing, uh, Tattoos and Misery and, and yeah. Minera, but we, you know, we do a show that's, it's songs from all the records and, you know, representing the whole catalog. And I've been singing the songs, you know, a lot of fans don't realize, you know, that I wrote all those songs and basically what I would do back in the day, starting in the eighties, when I wrote like, give it to me good one in a million. I would make a four track demo and hand it to Pete with me singing and say, basically copy this and try to make it better. And uh, yeah. so I sang all the trickster songs first. And so this is me kind of taking it back, but it's been awesome. You know, I love, I've always been a singer, you know, but since back in the day, since I was a little kid singing Kiss and Van Halen and cheap trick songs, oh, yeah. you know, well, so you, it does your wife and family travel with you or no? Oh no, they they have they have lives here. You know? <laughs> you okay. know, once in a while they come out to shows, but no, it's not like that. You know, we 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 got 
you know, my my older daughter Lily's in she's in uh, law school now, and my little oh nice grade. So we 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 have a busy family life, sports and everything back here. Right, right. Uh, no, dad's gonna be away, but you know they're used to that. <laughs> so you just have two daughters. I do. Yep, two daughters. Okay. Awesome. So you're in it with me. I got two boys, man. It's just, <laughs> hey, listen, whatever. It really does. It's like, you know what I always thought, and you you were you probably came from the same thing. You thought maybe one day um, I'll be on stage and my kids will be at my show yeah. and they'll go, wow, look at my dad. It's so <laughs> not so not true. I'm not cool. I'm a tool. I mean, I didn't realize I'm an actual tool. My kids, biggest <laughs> show, thousands of people sitting there, and they're like on their phones. They're like, "Where's your the mom pizza? comes? Your mom yeah. comes to see you." <laughs> like, "Where's the pizza?" Yeah, I mean, you know, again, that's this is the way it is. You know, my daughters have eyes at me; they've been seeing it for years. Um, you know, a couple times they uh, honestly though they came out. My first couple Def Leppard shows, they came out and they, I, I think they were actually, well, Jade was real. My little one was really young at the time. She was only like two and a half. She actually fell asleep on the third song. Her <laughs> <laughs> daughter, Lily, she was loving it. She came out to California and uh, she, she was like, wow, that was really cool. But, you know, there's the usual, you know, they're around it all the time. Right, and they say, right. And they just roll in. Doesn't mean anything to them anymore. Yeah, it's a break. Stop singing. Stop yelling. Stop. You know. I know. Why do you keep getting more guitars? You're like, oh, come on, man. More is more. More is good. Tell all your fans where they can find you, and all our all your new fans that we're going to get from this. Where can they find why. you? Very simple. Steve Brown rocks. You know, Steve Brown rocks on on uh, on Instagram, TikTok, um, X, whatever it's called. Yeah, you have a lot on TikTok. I saw a lot of you on TikTok. Yeah, everything. Yeah, and and YouTube. You have a lot on YouTube too. Oh, yep, that's right, Steve Brown. Yeah, rocks. very big on YouTube. Yes, we love the YouTube. So yeah, it's been uh, you know incredible, and uh, you know we're uh, like I tell what you know. It's a funny story. PJ is fifty two now. I always remember PJ and I have been playing together for the better part of 36, 37 years since he was 14 and since I was 16. And I always thought, man, I know we're going to be getting old when PJ turns 50. <laughs> God, PJ is 52. And, um, I, and I, it's funny because I say now I say it and I mean it more than ever. I told PJ when he turned 50, I said, you know what, dude? The first 50 years were just a warm up for us. The next 50 years are going to be even better. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's getting back to what I said before. This is what we love to do. Playing music is like breathing for us. So getting back out on the road, whether it's being in the studio, I just did a new song for PJ and we're always working because we are full time musicians. So right. it, again, you know, this is just, just such a blessed life to have. And, you know, for all the fans out there who's been there for the journey with us the whole time, mm -hmm. thank you for making us, you know, the making up because without you guys, the fans and our friends out there, we couldn't do this. So no, thank you couldn't. You're right. And thank You're a hundred percent right. Steve. Show. You know, I we, so we appreciate you coming time for us, you know, absolutely. And now, Steve, I know you actually have parents. And the reason I know that is because you're actually alive on this earth. But how <laughs> you have another mom who has purple hair, who's going to be like, and she's going to refer to you as Steven. And you're going to be like, Steven. Steven, are you are you on the road? Do you have enough? Are you making sure you have enough fiber in your diet? That's and you're gonna, now you're going to have to deal with that. Healthy living, healthy living. Yeah, and it's great. Well, yeah, my mom, living. you just turned 89 years old. I'm blessed to still have my parents. Oh, God, love her. Oh, yeah, awesome. We went out to lunch yesterday. They still live in the same house where Trickster was formed in Paramus. That's wonderful. Serious. Wow. That's great. That's great. My mom always goes every time when my parents, my dad and mom and dad actually drive me to the airport a lot when I go to shows. And my mother, my mom always goes, Steve, make sure you give it to them good. <laughs> That's hey, great. And as soon as I get uh, my hands on that model, I'll, I'll go online. I'll order it. Just while I'll just have it shipped here. I'll, I'll shoot a video, send it to you. 
And uh, if you don't mind, you know, down the road, maybe six, seven months, we'll touch base with you, have you on, maybe do a part two and see what you got going on at that moment. Yeah, yeah. after your tour and stuff, you can give us a, a down low on everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm everybody would love it. Jersey, yeah. uh, headlining the Orange Lantern. <laughs> wait, don't say, I'm going to the yeah, Orange Lantern. Yeah. I like that place. It seems like, wait a minute, I'm headlining Cup Saw Clubhouse. Wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, that Rubik's Cube, can't wait. So thanks, Hello, for yeah. in. thanks for your place so with the man. Thank oh, you yeah. so much for taking the time to be with us today. We are Funny Minds, and you can find us funnyminds.com. You can go on, and uh, we have two organizations that we're really uh, very proud to be associated with, and that's St. Jude's Children's Hospital and Breast Cancer. And if you go on, there's a big purple button, and you if you uh, see fit to donate to those organizations, it would be wonderful. If you can't, if there's anything you can do to volunteer in any way, it would be wonderful. And uh, we thank you very much, Steve. And we loved having you on. I was so excited to meet you. And uh, I've heard so much about you. I've listened to a lot of things. And, you know, it's it's different when you actually put the face to the person. And I really appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks for having me on and my you guys are my uh in my Jersey for rock and roll family. So All right. Yes. All right. Yes. No matter where we go, like I always tell everybody, you know, yeah, baby world, when we come back, it's when we come back and play Jersey, we're gonna be there May eighteenth at the uh Debonair Music Hall with Trickster. You know, it's all it's this is where it all started and it's always that Jersey heart and soul mentality. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, can't get yourself out of it. All right, Steve, it's been it's been real. It's been wonderful. Good luck to you. Thank I'll be you, watching. Brother. I'll be listening, and uh, go get him, boy. That's it. Rock and roll. Yep. Good, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks so much, hey, brother. Thank you Bye. so much. Honestly, thank you. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Good travel, baby. Talk to you soon. Bye.